feel like despite 3D games looking more and more photorealistic, we are now in the renaissance era of 2D games. So many gorgeous looking games have been released over the past few years that have relied on their creative and incredible looking 2D art style rather than pure 3D graphical fidelity. Tales of Iron is one of those games using its stylized 2D art to tell an epic adventure alongside its enchanting narration. And thank you so much to Oddbug Studio, United Label, and CI Games for providing a review copy. If you do enjoy the video, consider subscribing for more gaming news, reviews, and discussions. So with that said, let's jump into a world where rats and frogs are mortal enemies and Doug Cockle's sweet, docile tones serenade you as you fight your way through a vividly crafted world. Tales of Iron is a 2D side-scrolling Souls-like RPG featuring some very difficult boss fights and launches on September 17th for Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox consoles, and Steam for $25 digitally. I also went for the Platinum Trophy, so I'll quickly go over trophy requirements after the review portion of the video. You play as Reggie the Rat, the smallest of three brothers. His father, King Raddus, first of his name, successfully defended the Rat Kingdom from frog evasions in his youth, however, now in his old age, needs new heroes to step up and defend the kingdom. You start your quest with your kingdom behind you, giving you the tools and resources you will need to take down the pond scum. You quickly meet your brothers, the cook who provides a meal, and the blacksmith who crafts you a new set of armor. You march behind them and your father to defend the Rat Kingdom as crowds cheer you on. Of course, then, everything goes wrong as the frogs launch a preemptive strike, killing your father and capturing your brothers. Reggie is left for dead and his newly inherited kingdom is in shambles. Your newly crafted armor destroyed, Reggie is forced to pick up a broken shield and sword so he can rush off to defend his kingdom and rescue his brothers. Along the way, you'll fight frogs and other creatures as you attempt to restore your kingdom. The story, while at times dark, is very charming and endearing, and with Doug Cockle narrating it, it was almost like Geralt Rivia was reading me a bedtime story. A bedtime story filled with brutally difficult bosses that were more than happy to smash my face in repeatedly, so let's talk about the gameplay. Tales of Iron is a self-described Souls-like, however, of course 2D gameplay will be different from 3D gameplay like in Dark Souls. There's a ton of very difficult boss fights, something I've always loved. I just enjoy the challenge of figuring out the mechanics of a boss and perfecting my muscle memory to overcome that challenge. You travel across the world fighting a variety of enemies, all having unique attack patterns that you'll have to learn if you want to progress. There's a good variety of standard enemy types and way more bosses than I imagined I would see in this type of game. You'll fight everything from multiple types of bugs, frogs, and even zombies, so it is a very epic adventure. And the game does a good job of organically teaching you how to play through the start of the game. Even if you're new to the style of game, all players will get a good sense of how the mechanics work, but of course those familiar with Souls-like games will be right at home. It's a medium-paced action combat requiring you to dodge, block, or parry at the right time. When you dodge, you can hit the button once to do a small dash, or twice to do a dodge roll, and there will be times when which one you choose to use will make a big difference. Enemies will display a color over their head indicating what type of attack they are performing, and each color will require you to act in a different way. There's white or no color attacks that can be blocked, green that can be parried, and two types of red that are unblockable. However, that being said, some of the more complicated enemies will have more than one type of red unblockable attack, so you will have to carefully watch their movement to determine your best strategy. And later on, bosses' attacks can be extremely fast, so you really need to learn their attack patterns and how to deal with each attack. The controls felt slightly awkward at first and did take a short time to get used to, However, once I did feel comfortable with them, the controls felt very fluid and were very responsive, and the hit detection for the most part felt spot on, outside of a few minor instances. Similarly, fighting multiple enemies was also a little awkward at first, although I did get used to it later on once I learned their attack patterns. The only issue I did run into a handful of times was that sometimes one enemy would block my view of another, making it difficult to see what attack they were going to perform, it wasn't a huge issue, but it was a minor annoyance alongside one or two areas that had foreground scenery blocking my view of small areas of the screen. Bosses started off simple, but by the end became much more complex, having multiple phases and randomized attack patterns providing some really exciting battles. While there's a ton of different weapons to collect, there's three main archetypes. Sword, Spear, and Axes, all with one-handed and two-handed versions. While in most souls likes you use the right bumper button to do a light attack and the right trigger to do a heavy attack, Tales of Iron is a little different. The bumper uses your one-handed weapon, and the trigger uses your two-handed weapon, and both attacks can be charged. So while it's very similar, you will have both weapons available at all times, and certain ones will need to be used in certain situations. I really liked the risk versus reward system where you could stun certain unblockable attacks with a charged two-handed attack. 
The risk being, of course, that you need to very precisely time the charging up of your tack, and even if you slightly miscalculated your timing, you would get your face reduced to mush. However, it felt very satisfying when I was able to pull this off, although easier said than done considering how fast some of the later bosses' attacks were. And if you are playing on the PlayStation 5 version, there is haptic feedback for the trigger buttons. I did test it out and it seemed to work just fine, although haptic feedback hurts my hands so I did have to turn it off, but it is there for people who enjoy it. Instead of straight up health potions, you drink bug juice, however, you have to hold down a button to drink it. This meant you never wasted your health potion, although you did have to strategically use it since it would take some time to actually drink the bug juice. I actually liked this and it added another layer to strategizing how to defeat a boss or a difficult encounter. Bosses for the most part were very well designed and I was shocked at how well balanced they were. Especially in the first half of the game, the difficulty curve felt fine-tuned to perfection. Each boss pushed me just a little further, requiring me to master the game's mechanics. Combat arenas were tight, forcing you to really master the controls and left little room for error. They felt like a cleverly designed puzzle, requiring me to figure out how to put all the pieces together to figure out how to defeat them. You will have to find the exact right move and execute it at the proper time for success. Sometimes just a dash instead of a full dodge made all the difference in defeating a boss. Although after that midpoint, I found two bosses in particular to be extremely challenging, and I'm fairly certain they were meant to be a gear and skill check on the player. They really required perfect timing and precision to defeat, and I think a lot of Souls-like fans will have a lot of fun with them. As you explore the world and rescue your rat companions, you will periodically return to your castle, which has been destroyed by the frog attack. Sometimes once rescued, they will join you for part of your journey, even helping you out with several boss battles. This made the world feel alive, and that there were more people living in it outside of my character. I became attached to a few of my companions, and the fact that they accompanied me for a part of my quest made me care about what happened to them during the story. The only voice acting is provided by Doug Cockle, who does an absolutely fantastic job with the narration. The younger mice speak using flute noises and pictures. I found this to be a charming way to tell the story, and there were at times some really great uses of humor, so be ready for a lot of rat-related puns. To get around only having one voice actor, the developers made a really great use of environmental and background storytelling. Despite its 2D nature, Tales of Iron found ways to tell additional stories through always having something going on in the background. At times it was just a simple pop culture reference or showing the rats rebuilding their homes, but it made the world feel lived in. I enjoyed the music, although it felt like it was more there for a background atmosphere and was not prevalent in the mix outside of when you're inside your castle. This game was made by an incredibly small team, so I'm always amazed at how talented developers can find ways to work around limitations and what they did worked perfectly within the confines of the world they created. While I think a lot of people will come for the difficult combat, I do think many people will leave the game charmed with the world Oddbug Studio created. During your adventure, you'll be tasked with fixing up the castle, which will restore both the cook and blacksmith. This allows you to cook meals that will increase your maximum health, and you'll also be able to craft new weapons and armor. Gear is the main form of progression as there is no experience or levels in Tales of Iron. This gave the gameplay a good pace as you were never out of the action too long or having to worry about recovering lost experience. Like in most Souls likes, you will have to balance your gear's weight, so there will be a times where you want to sacrifice some defense in order to use weapons that hit harder. That being said, I never seemed to have too much difficulty keeping my weight in either the light or medium zone, and really had to go out of my way to reach the heaviest gear weight zone. And while there does seem to be some differences in your agility, it didn't make enough of an impactful difference, so I generally stayed within the medium weight range so I could generally use the best weapons and most of the best armor throughout the game. Some pieces of armor will give resistances to certain types of enemies, which I did find to make a huge difference. You're not able to change your gear on the fly, only at gear stations scattered throughout the map, generally near save points. This meant you did have to strategize and plan out your gear for the upcoming challenges, depending on what enemies were in the area. While Tales of Iron is a mostly linear game, you will be able to revisit all locations through fast travel. There is some platforming and wall jumping, but I would not call this game a platformer. It's really just a means for traversal and not really used much gameplay-wise. Several factions will have quest boards that will give you side quests which will reward gold and other currencies. Although they are presented as side quests, they are essentially mandatory. In order to pay for Reggie's inherited castle to be repaired, he has to earn gold to pay the workers. This happens several times throughout the story, and while it worked from a gameplay perspective, it did grind the narrative to a halt. The first time it was played off as a joke, as a king having to work for gold, but after a few times it really did start to kill the pacing of the game. Being forced to do side quests essentially meant you had to backtrack to areas that had already been cleared out, 
and do multiple side quests to earn the gold needed to progress the story. The thing is, while I had to revisit areas I had already cleared out, the side quest almost always featured new enemies and bosses, and some of those bosses proved to be some of the most challenging ones the game had to offer. I think they could have found a better way to organically incorporate the side content into the main story, which would have helped the narrative pacing a bit. This would have made the game flow much better because it was fun content. Although at the same time, I do get that developers created such an incredible looking world that they wanted to use some areas more than once, so maybe the content should have been optional instead of mandatory. As far as the Platinum Trophy goes, I think this one is going to be a big hit with Trophy Hunters. From what I can tell, nothing is missable, or at least I didn't find anything that I couldn't go back to if I had missed it. For the most part, you just need to finish the story, collect all gear, finish all quest boards, find just a few collectibles, and do some optional sign content that I don't want to spoil. But it's very manageable, and you will find most of what you need for the Platinum Trophy just by completing the game. And as an additional bonus, I checked, and the PS4 and PS5 versions have separate trophy lists, so you can go for the Platinum twice. The store page says you will get both versions with a PS5 purchase, so great news for trophy hunters. Overall, I didn't have many outright complaints outside of some of the narrative pacing issues. From a technical standpoint, the game worked basically flawlessly. With a PS5 version, it ran at a smooth 60fps, and I didn't see a single frame drop, nor did I encounter a single glitch or bug. Of course, when it comes to that, everyone will have a different experience, so even though I had no issues, that doesn't mean you won't run into any. That said, they must have done some extensive QA to make everything run as smoothly as it does. Difficulty-wise, I didn't have too much trouble, but obviously this is one area of reviewing a game that is really subjective. But comparing it to other Souls-like games I've played, I did have an easier time with it, although that's not to say it was an easy game, it's actually quite difficult. I think the bosses were tuned really well to provide just enough challenge, but not be overly frustrating to the point where you won't be able to progress. And not having any experience to worry about, you can just jump right back into your next attempt and not have to worry about grabbing your lost experience. The save points were fairly generous and generally placed near key locations. The RPG mechanics were a little simple for my taste, but the gear system worked well within the confines of the game. Each weapon type provided a different moveset, and I did find some weapons to work better on certain bosses. For example, the spear had a better reach than the sword, but it only attacked straight ahead while the sword attacked in an arc so I did like having to find the best weapon to use against some of the more difficult bosses. I only have a few nitpicks, but obviously these might be deal breakers for some people, or some people might like these mechanics, everyone has different tastes. But for me, they felt minor compared to the overall quality of the game. I do wish there was a little more variety to the combat. While you do get a ranged attack and can poison your weapon later on, there's really no special moves or combos that you can learn. Having a few cooldown moves or something to that nature would have helped, but that's more of my own personal preference. The combat, while not overly complex, was really solid and worked well, and there was a good amount of boss variety. Some of the later bosses got a little spammy with unblockable attacks, and there weren't many opportunities to parry on some of them as well, but overall very well done. The artwork was phenomenal, and because it looks so great, I do wish we got to see a few more above-ground areas. While there is a good deal of the game on the surface, a lot of it takes place underground in sores, crypts, and things of that nature. Don't get me wrong, they also look amazing, I just wish we got to see a little more variety in the locations. Game length wise, it felt just right for me at roughly 6.5 hours given the $25 price point, although I did spend a little over 7 hours total to clean up some additional trophies. I was going for the Platinum Trophy and didn't want to miss anything, so I was exploring everywhere optional at first, which probably did extend my playtime a bit. I found out later that almost every location will be eventually used for side quests outside of some secret hidden passageways, so I didn't necessarily have to do the exploration, I just didn't want to miss anything. So I had a lot of fun, and I think there are going to be people with certain interests that will really enjoy the game. It's a straightforward narrative, but it does have a few twists, and I don't think it needed to be anything more than it was. It worked well as a glue to hold together the combat encounters and was a charming world with endearing characters. Similarly, the combat was not overly complex, but provided just enough tools to make fights engaging and provide challenge. If you're into difficult 2D games like Cuphead or Hollow Knight, I think you'll enjoy Tales of Iron, although do keep in mind it's its own thing and does play differently than those games, and for people who find the world charming and enjoy 2D art games, but do not have experience with difficult Souls-like games, I do think you can still enjoy this game. You might have some difficulty with a few of the bosses, but I don't think any will be an insurmountable challenge for you to defeat. And this game might prove to be a great way to ease into the Souls-like genre.
I also think this will be a big hit with trophy hunters considering the game length and trophy stacking opportunity. Okay, with all that said, I'm going to give Tales of Iron a gold trophy. It was a challenging and charming adventure and a really fun platinum trophy to go for. It's a little different from the games I usually play, so it was a nice change of pace for me. I was really impressed at how polished of an experience Tales of Iron was, and I'm interested to see the next game that Oddbug Studio comes out with. I generally am not a huge fan of DLC, but if done right, I think a Tales of Iron DLC would be great to see. They already have a good framework in place, and adding in a few more varied areas and maybe some additional combat moves would be perfect for a potential DLC. Anyways, there's a ton of games coming out over the next few weeks, so I have a lot more videos on the way. I'm still not sure on all the games I'm going to review, but I do plan on reviewing World War Z Aftermath and Back for Blood for sure. And I also have a few non-review videos planned as well that I'm extremely excited for. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Subscribing really helps out and will open more doors for me to do bigger and better things in the future. So thank you to everyone who has subscribed so far. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.